Welcome to Philadelphia and the UPS ramp and a uh, updated A300. It just got uh, one of its first uh, few uh, updates from any builds and the airplane is flying better than ever. Hello and welcome to the channel. Welcome if you're new. My name is Dave. I do the spy flights over on Twitch and every now and then I like to come on over here to YouTube and do what I call a complete cold and dark flight. This is a uh, uh, cold and dark. Everything is turned off and I try and show each of the buttons and things that I do so that you can take these increasingly complex airplanes and uh, be able to fly them here on uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator. And uh, the A300 from AnyBuilds is definitely one of those airplanes. And I gotta tell you, it keeps getting better and better. They're still plugging a few holes in the airplane, but it really is a fairly good flight. So what are we doing today? Well, we're gonna do a complete flight in the AnyBuilds. Uh, we're doing a freighter. Uh, we'll uh, talk a little bit about some of the uh, latest updates. This is a full flight. I'm using Navigraph and Simbrief. Simbrief. I do have Payware and Default Airports. And I'm also using Pushback Helper uh, so that I can do a pushback, although we don't really need a pushback on this flight. I am using real weather and real time. And at the time that we're recording this, there is a big cold snap uh, moving through the central and eastern United States right now after plunging the western United States into the deep freeze. And let me tell you, with minus signs, minus 27 in some areas. We'll look at uh, loading the EFB through the airplane. And we'll kind of take a look ahead and talk about uh, some of the things that are going to be coming uh, to this airplane uh, in the uh, next few weeks and months and then about this time next year. Our flight for today is Philadelphia to Louisville. Louisville is also known as uh, UPS Central. Uh, that's uh, one of the big hubs for UPS. Our departure is off of runway 27 left. You notice that there is not a SID or standard instrument departure. Uh, and I'll show you what it is that we do when Simbrief doesn't give us one of those. We do have a star, a standard arrival, uh, the DLAMP 6 to runway 35 right. Our cruise today is flight level 360. It's about two hours gate to gate with a flight distance of 739 nautical miles. So let's go ahead and hop on into the airplane here and uh, get started with all the cool things that we can do. First things first, I do have the airplane here at UPS. There are all sorts of big cargo operations here at, uh, at Philadelphia. In fact, one of them is actually called Cargo City. That's on the north side of the ramp. We're on the south side of the ramp where UPS is located. There is our runway for runway 27. So Simbrief did not give me a departure on the flight plan. But if you look into the charts, you'll see that there is the Philadelphia 3 departure. There are some airports that just don't have a whole lot of departures, so all they basically do is give you vectors off of the runway. So unless there's some sort of a, um, a, a special uh, instruction here, runway heading ATC will point you to your first waypoint. And uh, our initial climb clearance is going to be right around 5,000 feet. And our first departure point is the MXE. Uh, VOR. So after takeoff, we're going to be taking off, let's see, where are we? Right there. And it's the Modena VOR. So we're going to expect a right turn, Modena, and out we go. That's as simple as that's going to be. And keeping it simple, especially in a really big VATSIM event, is really nice to do. One of the things I've really, really liked about Navigraph lately is the fact that you can zoom in and get a really, really nice map here. In fact, you even see that we're at gate uh, 55 or 56 over on this. Plus, the weather is incredibly cool on this too. And one of the things I'm going to do is zoom out and show you that this flight may take a little bit of time. So I'm going to kick in the weather layers here. This is icing, and icing isn't going to be a big deal. Let's look at the jet streams and see what we've got. Holy moly! Yeah, you can see there's little arrows here, and this is just at flight level 220. Simbrief says flight level 360. So let's try 340. Oh my gosh, it's even windier. So the thing is, we're going to have the wind right in our face. And even though we might be cruising along at Mach 0 0.80, we're probably going to be moving over the ground at, if we're lucky, with winds like this, about 300 knots. So this one's going to take a little bit of time. So let's go ahead and I'm going to zoom this back in here. And we'll probably uh, taxi on out. Uh, Probably via Yankee, we're going to cross the runway, go on down, and get ready for our takeoff. I'm going to hit the little target here. That's going to keep this centered up. And now let's go ahead and start pushing buttons in the airplane. 
I have done the flight plan through SimBrief. So we'll go into the cockpit here. And the first thing to do is go over to the electronic flight bag. And the first thing you do is click the little airplane in the middle. And you got all sorts of uh, cool little things to do. But we're going to start with my flight. And we're going to import from SimBrief. Philadelphia to SDF. You can see that our winds right now are 200 at 13. We've got an altimeter setting of 2986. It's all right here and so nice to have it. You also get a local time and a Zulu time up here, which is really nice, especially if you're going to be doing an event like Cross the Pond. Because if you're doing something like cross the pond, you need to have an exact departure time uh, for your slot uh, so that you don't have to sit around and wait. I've turned on chocks, left stairs, uh, toggle ground power unit is on by default, and we're going to open uh, the main doors over here on the left side of the airplane. So you can see my main passenger door is opening and you can also see uh, the cargo door is opening. And if you look real careful, you can even see inside and see that the airplane is empty. Next thing that I like to do on this airplane is start flipping switches and turning the power on. So we're going to come on up here, go to the battery. Three batteries up at the top. One, two, three. As I work my way down on the power panel, there is external power. I'm going to turn on external power. You see that the galley power has been shed right now. I'm going to turn it on. The airplane does not have a galley, but it does have a coffee machine. And let's say coffee machines are important especially if you're flying and sim flying too, right? Today is the 14th. That is an even day, and Airbuses famously have two sets, independent sets of nav and logo lights. There's several ways to do it. Let nav and logo light system one or two. I use one on odd days and two on even days. And that's how it is that I go about uh, doing the nav and logo lights. There's several other things that some people do. I'm going to come right over here first thing and turn on my emergency exit lights. Actually, I'm not going to turn them on. I'm going to arm them. And then we're going to come over here. We have to fuel the airplane so no smoking is going to go on. And if we're nighttime, I would probably turn on the dome lights. And our airplane is coming to life right now. So you're going to see when you turn on the airplane, caution lights are always going to flash in your face. You just I usually spend most of my time turning those off. Now, we've also got the flight management uh, computer already in init mode, but if you've gone and set your um, uh, sim brief ID, click menu, and I usually do ACARS things on the copilot side, so ACARS, and I'm going to request my sim brief, um, my sim brief uh, flight plan. It's pending, and there it is. And then I'm going to go and put that one back over on the menu side, and then we'll do the flight plan stuff over on the pilot side. So AOC stands for Air Operations Control, and that's fairly standard uh, on all the jets in the airlines. We're going to clear that out, and I'm going to make sure we're at Philadelphia and SDF, and uh, my cruise level is in there from the flight plan, too. And then the first thing I'm going to do is come on up here to the very top, and what we're going to do is we're going to do uh, the IRSs. There are three of them. They're along the top panel, and I'm going to click the first one over the pilot to nav. You'll see it came over here and it said battery operation. I think that that means that it's connected to the battery, and then it goes into align mode. Then the next thing we'll do is we'll slide on over here to the co pilot side and do the same thing nav. It's connected to the battery, and then it is going into align mode. And then the middle one is right in the middle, and we'll do the same thing battery operation and align. While you're at it, if you want to, you can do your fire tests. So hit the squib test button and you should see the agent light go on. And then you can go and you can hit the middle button. Be careful, you don't want to hit the big buttons outside. And you should see loop A, loop B, and the APU goes, goes on. You could do the same thing over here for engine number two. Squib lights go on. Carefully push that middle button and wait for the red light to go on and it beeps. Now, if you've got quick views set up on your uh, airplane like I do, you can do a little thing that's kind of interesting. I'm going to hit the squib button. There's my lights. And now I'm going to get ready to go and look down at the control panel. But first with my mouse, I'm going to click the center button and hold it down firmly. And while it's flashing, I'm going to look down at the control panel and you can see engine one fire and it gives you your uh, list of things to do and you can even see a fire indicator there too and then release the mouse and you've done a fire check 
that's just sort of an advanced fire check that you can do on all of this. So all of that looks good, and we've done the fire checks, and all is right with the world. Let's come on over and let's start loading the airplane. So everything looks good here, and we're going to click the little airplane and go to weight and balance. I usually just go and get custom cargo from Simbrief, and this should be all of your latest data. And so our latest data, if we look over here, our load is on page three of the Lido style of charts, and it says 36.6, and so it says 36.59, so decimalizing and rounding it up, uh, that's going to be 36.6. So you can see that that's accurate. The next thing I'll do is check fuel 15,668. Let's go over to page one, 15,668. Say that's all correct. And so now what I'm going to go ahead and do is apply the load to the aircraft. And you'll see that there's going to be a box that shows up there and shows uh, seven and a half to eight minutes worth of fueling time. And if you go outside and have a look at the airplane, you can see, oh, look at that. Cargo containers are already aboard. So you could actually, at this point in time, close the big door. But we'll leave it open for a while. Come on down here. We've got a helpful little reminder here that says Align IRS. Please, please, please do not cancel that out until you actually hit Align IRS. I have forgotten to do that on occasion. And all of a sudden you look and see, hey, we don't have navigation. What's going on? Uh, so there you go. By default, my uh, SimBrief profiles give me a cost index of uh, 100. I'm told that cost, uh, best cost index numbers are between 65 and 85. I didn't bother to change it on this flight, so we'll just go with flight level one uh, with cost index 100, and we'll pop that in there. And a flight ID. Uh, we are a, a UPS flight today, so UPS, and we're flight 441 as usual, and we'll pop that in too. And all of that looks really good. If we were on VATSIM right now and there was no ATC, they've got something new and kind of neat that gives you a squawk code, uh, even if there's no ATC, to make it easier to identify you. So at this point, I would probably come over here and put my squawk code in. We'll just leave it at 2000. And then the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to just move my throttles forward, make sure that the reversers are working, just make sure that that's working. I'm going to test my speed brake lever. I don't use the... Um, the uh, uh, flap handle because there are five spots on this and there are only four detents over on my flap handle so I just use buttons on that and then the next thing I'll do is I'm gonna look down here and I'm just gonna go and make sure that my uh, controllers work I'm gonna push the rudder pedals I'm gonna turn on the uh, turn this you can see it's a little jittery right now my uh, my controllers getting a little bit old so that's why that's a little bit jittery. I just move it around and it stabilizes fairly nicely. Okay, over here we got fuel, five minutes of fueling to do. Let's go over here while we're at it and I'm gonna look at aircraft maintenance. You can see that the fuel panel is open right now. My oil and my APU and my engines are good. It's down a little bit in the blue hydraulic system. That's normal, we're not gonna worry about that but if you have maintenance checked it, you know, turned on, you really, really, really should. Uh, uh, check your uh, check your uh, maintenance on the airplane and you can go and do it really really simple I could just hit service the hydraulics and do it instantaneously and it will take care of that but I'm gonna leave this over here for now on weight and balance it's kinda chilly outside I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get a little bit of um, uh, get the APU going now so we're gonna go over here and to start the APU I want to put some pressure in the fuel line so I usually do inner tank pump two, and I'll turn that on, come on down here and hit my master switch. And you can see it says low pressure, but it eventually will go away with that pump on, and then we'll hit start. And the APU is getting ready to fire up. You could go outside the airplane, and you'll even hear the APU. It is windy here today in uh, Philly, so you can see our engines are spinning around a bit. And if we come to the back of the airplane, you'll hear the APU starting up here. Ah, there it goes, good. I was hoping it was gonna start up. Sort of like, did I remember to start it? 
and you'll even see a little bit of a heat plume out of the APU exhaust there, which is good. By the way, you can also do service. You could service the APU, at which point the APU uh, uh, maintenance doors will open uh, under the uh, tail of the airplane. If you service the engines, the cowling will pop up and you can see uh, that they modeled the inside of the engines too, which is really pretty outstanding. Okay, so all is right with the world here. Let's go ahead and start our flight plan. We'll assume that we've gotten our clearance and we can go ahead and plug it in. I usually copy and paste my flight plan into these notes here. I call it the flight strip. And if you look in the description below, you'll see that I've copied and pasted it in there. You can copy and paste the flight strip into your own notepad and adapt it and use it. This is how I take, keep my flight notes uh, all in one place, uh, especially on a big VATSIM event. Wow, is it helpful. Departure, we are departing off of runway 27 left. We are doing the Philly 3 departure, and there you go. And there should be uh, manual or vectors off the runway. There is going to be a route discontinuity, discontinuity. Okay, clearly we need a little coffee here. Some of those big words, right? Uh, and then our first waypoint, uh, the Mike X-Ray uh, uh, Echo um, way, uh, VOR. And then there's the uh, rest of the flight plan, Pensy. We will be flirting with Flirt. Uh, Kippy and Larry and Beats and Graham and LaJoy and Air and you cats. Ah, SDF, there's our arrival. Right now, SDF is landing on the three fives. So let's take a look at the arrival runways here. So over here at SDF, it says we're going to be landing on runway three five right. Thing is, is over here in cargo land, over here, maybe they would bring some of the cargo planes on 35 left. So I'm going to go ahead and just try and use a little logic. And I'm going to go and say they're going to want to reduce our taxi time, unless they're, of course, really jammed up. So I'm going to go with 35 left over here. And you can see in my stack of charts, uh, I know that they're landing on both 35 right and 35 left. I will take a look at the ATIS and see what runways they're using and get a chart for each runway because sometimes those controllers can change and may and say, hey, can you switch over to 3.5 left? And with me, it's very easy to be able to do that. So 3.5 left is going to be our arrival runway today. We're going to be coming in on the D-LAMP arrival via the UCATS uh, transition. So there's UCATS over there over Cincinnati. At Nerve, we're expected to be at uh, 10,000 feet. And then after that, we're going to do a southern transition down to Brel. So we need to make sure that we're going to transition to Brel when we set all this up, right? All right, so Star, we're going to go ahead and try for 3.5 left, ILS 3.5 left. It's the D-LAMP 6 arrival. And we're coming in via UCATS. And then there is a transition here called Bourbon. So looking at 3-5 left, Bourbon is really way out here. And even though I know we're not going to do that, I usually select if there is a waypoint that's way, way out from here. I usually select that one. Uh, that way I've just got a really nice center line for the runway, especially if we're going to be getting vectors to come in, which we will on this one. Our nav accuracy is now upgraded and our GPS primary is set. That basically means that the IRSs up here are finished with the alignment and you can see all the lights are out. Now you probably noticed if you just got this airplane that you can't set anything into the autopilot. All the numbers are gone. I'll tell you when I first got my old school Airbus like this one over an X-Plane, why can't I set this? I don't know. And it took me a while after reading the manuals and stuff that those don't work until you turn on the pitch trim and yaw dampers and ATS, which I believe is auto thrust systems. But I would start the airplane and turn them on and they would immediately turn off. And I thought, okay, what did I do now? Well, what it is, is you can't turn these on until after your IRSs have completed with the alignment process. Otherwise, they turn off. Surprise! Uh, it's cold here. I'm going to come over here, and now that the APU is up and running, I'm going to turn on my APU bleed. You're going to hear the blowers really kick into gear here. 
And then we're going to also turn on our window heaters now because it's chilly. Airplane is loaded, so let's come on over here and close the big door. We'll do that. Now, you know we're on the APU, but older airplanes, you really want to go and disconnect the power on the control panel here before you have the ground crew unplug them because some of the older airplanes, you could get shocked by doing that. So we're going to make sure the APU generator light is out and that the APU itself is available. And now I'm going to go ahead and disconnect external power. And we're going to pull the external power cart. I'm also going to close my main cabin door. We're all loaded up and ready to go. And at that point, we can also pull the left stairs, but I'm going to leave chocks in place for now. Come on back here. We're going to go ahead and we've got to do uh, some final weight and balance things. And that's what I call weight and balance page B. So init. And there was that main initialization page. The first thing we're going to do is page two or page B. And we have to put in our block fuel. And if we look up here, you can see our block fuel says T fuel, total fuel, 15.7. Look over at your fuel and it's uh, 15668. So decimalized and rounded up, it's 15.7. That means we've got correct fuel. So we can go ahead and put in 15.7. And that goes in the top. Next is zero fuel weight. I'll grab it over here. And that's going to be 117.25, 117 117.25. And that goes in there, which does the calculation and gives us takeoff gross rate, which is zero fuel weight plus block fuel, blah, blah, blah. ZFW, zero fuel weight center of gravity, also known as Mac ZFW. Has nothing to do with mac and cheese, but every time I see it, I start craving mac and cheese. So thanks, guys. And it's 29.9. Uh, so 29.9. And that goes in there. Now you can add a little bit in here. Uh, we did go ahead and budget for some taxi fuel. And our taxi fuel today is 1,746. You got to decimalize it. So I'm going to call it 1.8 with a little bit of rounding. So 1.8 is taxi. And then the last one that we can put in here is our alternate. Alternate fuel is 2.037. So we'll just do the whole thing and watch what it does. So 2.037. And that'll probably round it up to 2.1 maybe, 2.0. And now our initialization is done over there. Let's go on over to take off and approach now. And all of these numbers are done, so we can come over to weight and balance, and now we're going to do performance. So if you've already got your runways plugged in and everything, you should be able to go and select your runway. We know that we are going to be blasting off on runway 27 left. You can see 26 and 8 are in red, probably because the wind isn't going to be good for that, or it's closed or something. But we are, we're good with 27 left. Now we're going to sync all the weather. Winds are 200 at 8, the altimeter 1010. It's in hectopascals. I'm going to have my flaps 1515. Outside air temperature is 6. I'm going to be turning on my anti ice because I've reactivated anti ice in the sim and I don't want to fall out of the sky. And now we're going to calculate. And our flex is going to be 60 degrees. So we can come over here. And I usually hit the auto button and then flex to and 60. That may be an extra button push that I don't need to do, but sometimes it doesn't go into auto mode after takeoff and put you into climb power and cruise power. So that's why I hit the auto button first. While you're over here, your landing elevation is a good thing to enter. And so we'll go over to the airport. And Louisville is 501 feet above sea level. So 500 is about as close as we're going to get. And there we go. Next thing is going to be our speeds, 153, 163, and 163. So 153 once, 163, I'm going to look, did I forget? Yeah, 163 is rotate. And you can't put in V2, and it says FCU. No, it's not getting, giving you the bird. 
it wants you to come in and put it in up here. So 163, we're gonna put that in. And then I'm gonna put a second speed in. And so that's gonna be before we go into profile and everything like that. So there's 163. And then after that, I'm going to hit the uh, top of the button. The preset light comes in and I'm gonna put in, if there was a speed restriction on the departure, like 210 knots, uh, you could put that in. So we're gonna start with 210 because we've got a fairly tight turn over to our first waypoint. Okay, our altitude select, we know from the Philadelphia departure that our altitude, our initial climb clearance is 5,000 feet. So we'll put in 5,000 feet here. 5,000 feet, and it's runway heading off the runway. Runway heading off of 27 left is 267 degrees. So we can dial our heading to 267. 267. Am I going too fast for you? If not, one of the cool things about YouTube is you can stop the video you can rewind the video and play it again. So if you're falling behind because I'm going too fast, that's why I like to do the cold and dark types of videos over here on YouTube because you really can't stop a live stream and play it back, right? Well, maybe you can, I just don't know about it yet. And THS, that's gonna be our, um, that's gonna be our, um, this is going to be trim and it's gonna be down 0.2. And that's about as close as you're gonna get for a 0.2 trim setting. And all of that looks good. I'm gonna look over here. My parking brake is on. So we're gonna come back over to the airplane. We're gonna to go to ground gear. Everything is clear. I'm gonna pull my chocks. I don't need a uh, uh, pushback out of here. We're gonna just taxi straight out to the taxiway. So now it's time to start turning on the uh, airplane. At this point in time, I'm still learning the airplane. Oh, we haven't set our uh, altimeter. Right now the altimeter is 2986. Let's hit recycle and see. And it's changed, it's 2982. There is a weather system coming in here, so we're going to see the altimeters dropping. 2982. Very cold temperatures are on the way to Philly right now. And at tonight on, on the spy flight, we're actually doing a VATSIM event called Frozen in Philly because it's supposed to get really cold. Okay, so all that's good, but we're gonna do checklists now. And our first checklist uh, item is cockpit prep, and it's pretty much done. We've verified our fuel quantity. We've set our takeoff data. The landing elevation is set. Altimeters are set. Brakes anti-skid, normal and on. That is over here. Brakes and anti-skid, and it's on by default, but it's a checklist item. While we're at it, I usually will look up here and make sure that the accumulator brake is in the green zone because that's a problem. Windows and doors are all closed, and now that's to the line. So now it's before start. We'll turn on the beacon. We know that the parking brake is on, so our beacon is on. I'm gonna do cabin signs because there's five seats for people uh, to sit back there and everything's looking good. I'm gonna go ahead and turn on my outer fuel tanks, the rest of my inner fuel tanks, center tanks and trim tanks. Everything's ready to go. Let's go and start an engine. So starter system goes to A and we're gonna start engine number two. And you can see we're starter A and start to two. If you look down here, the engine shutoff is off. And over here, the number to look at is the N2 right here. And it's 20%. When that's 20%, we're going to turn on fuel. 19, 20. And if you've got the uh, Thrustmaster TCA Airbus Captain's Pack that has throttles, those switches will turn on your fuel on this airplane. It's pretty cool. And you can see that engine is coming up. If you feel like it, you could go outside. The startup sounds on this airplane are really pretty good. There's always a truck sitting in the way. By the way, we're just gonna plow through this. We're gonna act like all this is gone. 
because I believe this is a taxi out kind of a thing that they do here. Okay, and engine number two is starting. And in fact, the little starter light has gone out. And once that light goes out, you can go ahead and start engine number one, even if the start sequence hasn't com entirely completed on engine number two. So same drill as before, we're looking at the N2. The real pilots are also checking out their oil gauges to make sure that the oil um, uh, quantity doesn't start going down. And there's 20, engine goes on, you can see fuel flow or fuel used. Nope, we're not getting, we're not getting flipped off by the airplane, but they do use an awful lot of those. And there goes that engine. Engine start sounds pretty cool in this airplane too. Usually on the live stream, long before now, somebody's put in chat, hey, you gotta do your backup artificial horizon. I always thought you did the backup artificial horizon, you uncaged it after you started the engines. I, that Maybe that's just an old school pilot kind of a thing, but I usually wait until after I get my engine started and there uh, is vacuum in the system and all the other stuff that's supposed to be working with that. Okay, our engines are started, so we can come down here. Ignition goes to off. I'm going to come over here, and the APU bleed can go off, and you'll see that the uh, engine bleeds will then automatically turn on, and they've turned on, so that looks good. We can come over here, and the APU is still on, but the first thing to do is come up to that generator panel on the electrical panel. Make sure engine one and engine two generator lights are both out, before you turn off the APU, otherwise your whole airplane goes dark. The whole airplane goes dark. And everything is looking pretty good. After start checklist. And so we can come over here. Pitch trim, we've set that rudder trim. It's almost always zero when you first start, but if you do a second flight, you're gonna notice that your rudder trim has got a number in there, and you're gonna want to go ahead and zero that out. Spoilers also known as speed brakes, armed. And slats and flaps, they're going to be 15 and 15. So I use buttons for this one. And there goes slats and flaps, 15 and 15. And there goes some really big flaps and slats. You'll probably also notice that it looks like my engines are in slightly slight reverse mode. There is a problem right now with engine idle, at least with the Thrustmaster Airbus stuff, and I've tried to calibrate it out, but you just have to push your throttles forward a little bit. Slats and flaps are 15 and 15. Uh, ECAM status should be clear. ECAM status is clear. Up, oh, transponder is to standby. We should start squawking mode Charlie on taxiways for VATSIM. Anti-ice, oh boy, am I glad that's there. We want anti-ice because it's getting cold. Uh, slats and flaps and hand signal, we're ready for taxi. So up here we go, we're gonna go ahead and do the taxi light on. That looks good. If you've got uh, anybody out in the, in the cabin, you could ring the uh, seatbelt sign. That'll ring the bell back there, let them know, hey, we're gonna start rolling the airplane around. And I'm also going to turn on my probe heaters when all the ground crew is clear of the airplane. Parking brakes are off. My tow brakes are on. Look over there. Is there anybody there? Nope. Here we go. And we're going to go and get on that one little taxi line over there. Again, don't worry about the uh, ground clutter here. I know it's a little bit of immersion busting, but I don't know how to clear that. And out we go, throttles back to idle. And then be sure and move that throttle just to a touch forward. And out we go. Maybe you'll need to have a little bit more going out. While we're doing that, I'm gonna come down here to flight controls. And we're gonna do the flight control check. There's elevators, ailerons, rudder, and chances are your rudder is connected to your nose wheel a little bit. Not much, you have to use nose wheel tiller steering on this. And out we go over here. 
and we'll kind of come around here. Now, if you're on VATSIM, this is an area with, which is called the ramp area. And usually ramp areas are uncontrolled. But as you see, we're coming up to a different kind of a hold short line. Okay, this hold short line right here, this is also a ramp control line, so it's a little bit thicker, I believe, than the other one. So this is a hold short line for the runway, but you're also leaving the ramp and uncontrolled area here. In fact, I think that might be a part of what we're seeing up here. So there's the runway hold short line, I believe, there. And then that's ramp control. So now we should be talking to ground control if we're on that sim. I'm going to turn off flight controls, and they've just cleared us to go across the runway. I could be a little bit backwards on those things. I think the one up here, this one is a ramp control. If you're also on VATSIM, usually if there is a, if you're crossing an active runway, sometimes ground control will have you switch over to tower for clearance to cross a runway. So you might get a little bit of frequency dancing going on there. Yeah, I think that that back one might, might be wrong. I think that there should have been a ramp first. Okay, and now that we've crossed the runway, I'm going to come up here to this taxiway, which is usually Papa, and usually this is the one that they have you taxi out on here in Philly. Especially in the wintertime, one of the things that's going to be happening here in the wintertime soon is we're going to have to start doing anti-ice things and de-icing airplanes. And if you look over here, I went over to Papa because that would put us over in this area here, which I believe is a very big de-icing pad. That's also a staging area for um, your airplane, for different airplanes. So maybe they're gonna have a United flight at Papa 4 and a American Airlines at uh, Papa 5. And if the slot in the sky is clear for the United flight or whichever, they might, that's how they could get an airplane out first. And then we kind of come around here and we'll go and look for Papa 3. This is, uh, this is the payware airport. I mentioned at the beginning of the flight, I have both freeware and payware. So this is a payware airport for Philly. It's really nicely done. The terminal area is very well done too. Uh, the uh, freeware is the default airport that we're going into at Louisville. And it's pretty nicely done too. So I kind of like that one. Before takeoff checklist, flight controls we just did. We also have checked our flight instruments. Those are looking really nice. Uh, the briefing has been done, but probably rather poorly. Uh, V1, VR, and flex temperature are set 153, 163, 163. I did not set a flex that was over on another page, though. So I don't think I did that right. Slats and flaps are both 15 and 15 and we have a takeoff config button that we can press. So look down here, the config button is over here by the first officer. So tilt the view up and watch the uh, left hand ECAM monitor. Hold it down and that's how it tells you that you're, uh, you're good to go there. And around we go over here. And we said we were gonna look for Papa 3. And again, I think that this is used for staging airplanes, but also I think probably for de-icing. I'm not sure. I think if it was de-icing, maybe there wouldn't be grass in here. So I might be wrong about that. And there is L. And after L, this one should be Papa 3. And if you look over there, it is. Oh, it says Papa 2. No, Papa 3 over there, I guess. Maybe I turned one too early. According to my chart, I did. One of the things that you're going to find is the charts don't always line up. Now, I think I turned on L. And we'll just sort of stop here. Our checklist is pretty good. Transponder is going to go to Terra. 
And TCAS is set. Auto brake is going to be set to max. There's our auto brake to max. Ignition as required. We could go to continuous uh, restart if there was moisture in the air. Let's go ahead and get on the runway. Yeah, I think I got on Lima and not Papa. Oh, well. I don't think that the uh, Lima and Papa police are going to get me this time. Nice turn here. I generally try, especially in a tight area like this, if the airplane's capable of doing, you know, a thrust idle taxi, I just let the airplane do this. You can see we are moving along pretty good here. Crossing over the line to the uh, runway, I'll look up here and do strobes. And I usually just do mine to on. I want them on. And then I will also uh, extend the uh, landing lights. But I won't turn them on. If there was an airplane over there and we turned on the landing lights, we just blind the heck out of those pilots because they're really dark, uh, light. So I usually wait until I'm lined up uh, down the runway uh, for my uh, departure before I will turn on the landing lights. And we're all set. Usually you're going to get a lineup and wait for just a second. Uh, we're going to do a profile departure. We are going to do heading hold off the runway. Tower just called, cleared for takeoff. Landing lights go on. That's usually the last thing that I'll do. And at this point, I'll take my throttles and move them up about halfway. Look down here and see if we make it and our engines are stable. I'll then move them up a little bit more. And then as the engines uh, uh, spool up, I'll then hit the auto throttle button, which is also your takeoff thrust button on this airplane. We've got a little bit of uh, right rudder, so I'm gonna use a touch of left aileron. Not much, it's not that windy. Oh, maybe it is a little more windy. We're getting blown off to the side. Let's get back over on the center. There we go. That's a little better. And V1 and rotate. It, call, it does a minimum call out here when you take off. It could be because I'm not setting something correct. Gear up. And so long, Philly. Yeah, you can see there's a big de-icing pad over here. So there's a huge de-icing area over there. And a nice departure straight out. Flaps one. Uh, 15 and zero on this airplane. Let's see if the AP is ready to help us out. AP is on. And we're gonna hold 210, which is what we wanted it to do. Now we're also going to go ahead and see if we can't find, there's the MXE, so we'll get vectors over there. The older airplanes, I like to turn the airplane first. They, you, the newer airplanes, you could just go into the flight management computer and go direct to, and it would take you direct to, but the older airplanes get a little bit cranky about that. So I like to get ourselves going. ATC's called and said climb and maintain. Uh, 15,000 feet, hit the profile button again. Oh, doesn't like that, does it? I did something wrong there. Uh, let's see, we're going to MXC, so now I'm going to do my direct two. And by the way, this is also the way that I'll do this in the uh, Embraer E-Jets, just because it gets a little touchy. Now we'll go to Nav. And now it should let me do profile. There's profile. And we're past the letter S, so flaps up. And flaps are going up. And we can also come down here and disarm the speed brakes. And go over to the landing gear, and it's an older Airbus, so you have to put it in neutral. In a Boeing, you turn it off. In an older Airbus, you put it in neutral. There's our speed going up to 250. I also like to keep hitting the uh, 
heading select button just to make sure it's always pointed straight up in case I got into trouble with the uh, autopilot at least it tell me, tells me which direction I'm supposed to fly and if you get a chance look outside the scenery is absolutely amazing look at Philadelphia right now boy is it gonna get cold here soon it's gonna be chilly where I live right now, we've got minus signs. It, ha it isn't as cold. I think we made it down to almost minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit at my place the other day. There's 9,000 feet. ATC is called. And they have said going up to flight level 220 now. They usually will step you up depending upon whether or not you've got a departure control, whether you've got straight to center or something like that. And if they're really busy, they may just send you right up to your final cruising altitude if they're busy campers. After takeoff checklist, slats and flaps are retracted. Landing gear is up and neutral. Our packs are on. And the altimeters will get reset uh, at 18,000 feet. I'm going to go and slide that up to the top. So it's all ready for landing. There's 10,000 feet. Landing lights and nose light. We are above the clouds. I'm gonna leave the anti-ice on just a little bit more. It says it's five degrees, no ice. I don't think that there's a huge penalty right now. And since I've just turned on icing, make all the chicken sounds that you want, but I'm gonna be a giant chicken and leave it on just to make sure. But once we've, uh, you know, gone up a little bit higher and we're really clear of the clouds, then I'll go ahead and shut it off. The airplane did go into climb mode, so good airplane. And it's speeding up very nicely, too. Usually at this point, I'm going to go over here to progress on this side. And I'll do FMS on this side and flight plan. And you can see we're 560 miles out. <clears throat> Excuse me, a little bit coldy here from all these chilly temperatures too. And all of that looks good. We are nine miles from that first waypoint, MXE. No real constraints, so let's put airports on now. So there's airports. And there's our turn to Pensy is our next waypoint. Passing 13,000, ATC says, go ahead and climb to your final cruising altitude, which is 36,000 feet. There we go, 36,000 feet. This airplane also comes as a passenger airplane, although not many people are flying A300s as passenger airplanes right now. There's a few airlines uh, that still have a few passenger uh, passenger variants on this but not many most all of these have been have been converted over to uh, cargo and if you look kind of carefully at the side of the airplane you'll see that they've even modeled some of the old uh, passenger windows uh, the plugs for the passenger windows the thing about these uh, airplanes also is the avionics are a little bit on the old side and the profile is not quite as good as, say, a managed profile uh, in an Airbus A320, per se, for example. So one of the things that's going on is they have come up with what's called the Epic Upgrade. And that's uh, a um, avionics package where they basically rip out a bunch of this stuff and put all computer screens in there. And uh, you can start flying the airplane as you know, a more modern jetliner. This airplane gets a little bit cranky with uh, descents, with VNAV especially, and sometimes LNAV gets a little cranky too. So you'll notice when we're coming in on the descent, I will take it out of profile uh, and start managing my own descent. And I'm told that the real pilots with these older airplanes will do the same. 18,000 feet, uh, click the, uh, to uh, do this, uh, for the uh, altimeter, it says pull for standard. So you might notice there's my normal mouse pointer right there. If you put it on the uh, lower part of that dial and push it, it then puts you in standard. 
I also have all of my altimeters tied together. Yes, that does cost me a little bit in immersion and realism, but if I'm in a VATSIM event, I will tell you that I need all the help I can get. Because a VATSIM event, you have to do the work of both pilots, and if it's a busy event and uh, ATC has got you twisting and turning and doing all sorts of other things, at that point in time, you really just are a busy camper for sure. So coming up on 19,000 feet, and remember we were talking about the wind? Holy moly, look at this. We've got a 118 knot quartering headwind here. Our ground speed's 332. Yay, we're just not going at warp factor 10, are we? We're pretty much clear of the clouds now, so I'm going to uh, turn off my anti-ice now. We're well above the clouds and the moisture. But we'll keep an eye out for that, especially now that we do have uh, moisture set up. It does say that the total air temperature is in icing range. It's zero. But we are not in rain. We're not in snow. We're not in clouds. So icing should not be a big problem. I don't know if the airplane has any of the telltale uh, signs of icing. You know, you might see icing showing up here on your windshield wipers. Some airplanes actually have a little icing indicator up here. I don't know if that's actually modeled yet, Microsoft Flight Simulator, but there are, are some outside visual indicators that you can look at to see if ice has started forming on your airplane. I think this airplane will also start beeping at you if icing is occurring. I mean, we do have it telling us that we're in the temperature zone, but, you know, it's not going to be quite... It doesn't say it's actually happening. And I don't know that you could actually go outside the airplane like this and look at the leading edge of your wings and see ice and stuff. So I don't think that that happens. Although there are some airplanes that if you do have icing turned on, you will see it uh, accumulating on your nose cone here. So you'll see that too. And out we go as the clouds start to thicken up here. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and close the checklist. And you can see our progress bar. And I'm going to hit the update. And the METAR for SDF says the winds are 270 at 10, gusting to 14. 10 miles visibility. So visibility is good. There's a few clouds here and there. It is minus 10. And the altimeter is 3029. We left 7 degrees in Philly. So it's minus 10 with a dew point of minus 18. So the cold air has started to move into, um, in, into uh, Louisville. And it really has been uh, an absolute uh, real wind uh, chill out here. If we go here and we zoom out. So let's see, I'm going to go ahead and turn off the tracker for a second and zoom out and look at the whole United States. And we're going to go back in here and we'll turn on weather and take a look at the jet streams. You can see things are really swooping down from up north here. So cold air, cold Arctic air just swooping right into the region. And it's still cold uh, in uh, the Pacific Northwest because we've still got that jet stream there, but it's really, really kicked into gear here. So yep, cold air for a while, definite cold snap. I believe we have a, there's temperatures. So you can see there's much colder here to the north. You can also do, um, one of the things that I do also like to take a look at is just mean sea level temperature, uh, pressure I mean. Uh, get an idea of where the highs and lows are little bit of a low pressure system just to the west of Denver right now but high pressure starting to settle in and a big low up here that's just going to keep shooting the cold air right into the US so there's our flight I'll turn the tracker back on and it should center on us we're done uh, with the uh, departure airports so usually what I'll do is I've got all of my charts stacked up down here in the order that I need them. 
when I know that I'm not going back to uh, Philly or my originating airport, I'm gonna go and clear those out. It eliminates confusion a little bit. I'm able to go right to the star, uh, right to my runways and right to the airport, which is really nice. Uh, past 25,000 feet, I'm gonna do seat belts off. And if you look back here, you can go back and see in the cabin, fairly nicely modeled here. The cabin itself is modeled too. If you come down here, you can see and you put your, 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 your pointer on this, that's the manual gear handle. So if you need to, you can go and crank the gear down. And you would crank the gear down right over there. It's closer to the co-pilot seat. We can open up the door, head on back here. You can see we have a very, very nice UPS uh, yellow jacket. There's some suitcases. There is a metal box. And if we come on out here, you can see the big safety netting here. And there's two seats over on this side. So we got two seats over there and you can see there's oxygen up here. And there's some flashlights. And then there's three seats over here. And then if you slide on in here, you can see we've got a coffee machine. Looks like a couple of drawers. Uh, I'm gonna guess maybe a small little refrigerator too. So they at least left a coffee machine aboard for the cargo pilots, which I think is really nice of them to do. Uh, you can't go into the bathroom. There's nothing in, in the lavatory or anything. There is our big entry door. Uh, you can look out over here. You can actually walk through the netting area. So if we walk through the net, you can see there's the upside down UPS sign. And you can see big cargo containers. And this panel is operational too. So you could actually go and use this uh, and do some of the loading things. Uh, that you would do and operate things from back here. Even gives you cargo door operation instructions on how to do that. So that's pretty cool. They've done uh, some, one of the things that any builds does, particularly when it comes to um, um, modeling uh, cargo operations, they did a, an amazing job on the Beluga. They really did. And here we are passing 30,000 feet we are 500 miles out. Uh, you can see we're coming up on our top of climb. One of the things that I'll start doing as we get close to the top of climb is take a look at my estimated fuel on board, EFOB, and that's estimated fuel on board when we land at Louisville. So when we land at Louisville, SDF, like that, we should have about 8,200 ki uh, kilos. I'm not, I, I do the Airbuses in kilos. So that's pretty good. The thing is we're still in climb mode and that number sometimes is a little bit squishy. Especially if you get some really long direct twos. We had a flight yesterday where I mean, we took off out of Zurich and we did two waypoints and then ATC directed us to a waypoint right on the uh, coast of the English Channel. We flew all, all across France with just one waypoint on the coast. So the more, you know, the, the farther away those waypoints are, I think that the flight management computers really like to have waypoints and that's how they recalculate things. So I'll keep a close eye on this. And when we get to our final cruising altitude, I'll look and see. The flight plan says the EFOB number should be this one down here. It's final reserve and alternate, and it should be 4, uh, point, 4007 or 4.0 probably is what it would be. And what this number is, final reserve and alternate, is a combination of those three numbers that you see there. So final reserve fuel, that's what uh, it, we need to get to our, our, our uh, alternate airport. That's the middle one here. Final reserve is 30 minutes of flying, extra flying, and then contingency is 15 minutes of, oh my God, we gotta do something, fuel. 
So all of these three fuel numbers right here add up to this one. So that's the number that I pay attention to. Another number that I did not check that I've been uh, wanting to check more and more is minimum takeoff fuel. And that is before I taxi onto the runway, I'm trying to remind myself to go over and look at that minimum takeoff fuel, which should have been 13.9. And if your takeoff fuel down here was 13.9 uh, or, or more for takeoff, you've got enough fuel to do the flight. If you spent a long time on the ground waiting, then maybe you're starting to get below that 13.9. We've already been flying for a while, so that 12.6 doesn't bother me as much. And our ground speed has picked up a little bit. Wow, we are at 354 uh, knots of ground speed instead of 300. But as we climb, our uh, winds are picking up a little bit too. So again, quartering uh, headwind in a way. 128, you can see we're definitely a little bit crabby here. And we should be coming up on our final cruising altitude at 36,000 feet. So generally, if this is the first uh, cold and dark video you've done with me, what I usually will do is I will, as we get to cruising altitude, we'll look over here and on this airplane, you're gonna find your top of descent is gonna be your best clue about your top of descent is gonna come up over here. And you see there is that top of descent indicator between uh, Warsaw and Nerve. So in our flight plan over here, between Warsaw and Nerve, which is right over on this side, it's way over here. That's our actual top of descent. So usually what I will do is um, stop, the, stop recording the video. And you should, if you're flying along with me, you should stop the video too. And then, right now our, uh, our map range here is set to 30 miles. So we'll turn off airports and we're gonna kick it up to 120. So there's 120. So there's 80 miles and then the top ring up here is 120. So when your top of descent hockey stick shows up and it's halfway between the top ring and the 80, that's when I'm gonna start the recording again, which is about 100 miles from top of descent. And that gives us plenty of time to go and figure out what we're gonna do. I'm also gonna reset my heading bug so it's straight up. And we got about 500 feet to go. We'll check the fuel and then we'll take a break. I can go and get a second cup of coffee. Uh, you can go and get uh, whatever it is that you've got in your SIM cockpit. And that way you don't have to just sit and listen in. One thing that I do like to suggest on a flight, if you're flying alone like this, be sure and take a little bit of time, unless you've got nothing but clouds, to just look out the window and enjoy. The scenery from 35,000 feet is absolutely amazing. If you got a little hole in the cloud, that scenery is, this is what it would look like. So if we were doing this flight right now, and we had just taken off from Philly and we're heading out towards the west, this is kind of what it would look like. Hey, we got a little break in the clouds over here. And you'll see incredible landmarks too. You'll see the cities, uh, the highways, uh, even train lines sh are, are showing up in the sim. And um, if getting in an airplane and going and uh, flying someplace and enjoying the view outside the windows is one of your favorite things to do like it is for me That's one of the cool things for you to do. So If you get a chance, that's one of the that's that's one of the nice things about all this and we are at our final cruising altitude of 36,000 feet the airplane is now automatically in cruise mode and Let's see here. We have just we're coming up on a waypoint here so we just passed Beats, and we're about ready to get to Graham. How far away? Four miles from Graham. So what we'll do is we'll wait till we get to Graham. That way the flight management computers have a waypoint to recalculate everything. We'll check our fuel, and then get ready for a, uh, a, uh, a little pause break here in the flight. Another thing I'll do just before I hit pause, just hit a recycle on this one. Make sure that there's nothing that's really changed. 
Winds 270 at 10, gusting to 14. If you've got Navigraph, one of the things that you can do is go to airports, go to information, go to runways. We're planning the uh, three fives. You can see that the three fives have a, a headwind. You can see that uh, the um, one sevens have a tailwind. We don't want to do that. And you can see over here on runway one one, it's got a red one. So we're looking good as far as runway choices uh, for our landing. So that looks really good. It is going to be a little bouncy. Okay, and we have just passed. All right, so we just passed Vince, and now we're to Joy. The computers are redoing all the numbers. So let's go ahead and do fuel prediction again. And it says 8.5. Our optimum altitude is flight level 340. We're at 360, so we're probably using a little more fuel. We could have stepped, stopped at 34 and continued the climb a bit. So we might be using just a little bit of fuel, but not much. 8.5 will probably drop to maybe 8.1 or 8.2 by the time we get there, but it's well above that 4.0, which is final reserve and alternate. So we've got extra fuel. I usually board about an extra 2.0 kg or 2,000 pounds if I'm in a Boeing. If I'm in a VATSIM event, I will usually board extra fuel just because you never know if there's going to be some twists and turns. So we're all set. Uh, we'll go ahead and we'll plan on meeting when your top of descent hockey stick is between the top ring and the second ring down there. And I will look forward to seeing you then. In the meantime, like I said, I do hope you get a chance to just go outside the airplane, enjoy the view, and see you when we get ready for descent. And there we go, about 100 miles from top of descent. Welcome back, thank you for coming on in. Uh, full disclosure, there was a problem yesterday when I started this flight, so we're picking it up again. Uh, I actually took off, this is the day after. So if it seems like a few numbers might be off, there's, uh, there's a reason for that. But we're still flying. We're on our way to uh, Louisville. Nothing else has changed. There's our top of descent. One change that did get made, and this was actually a change that I made yesterday, was I did go in and put a 10,000 foot constraint in at the nerve checkpoint. And the reason that I did that is if you take a look over here on the uh, D-LAMP 6 arrival that we're doing, the only real constraint is expect 10,000 feet at nerve. It says expect, so that doesn't automatically populate in your uh, flight plan that you would download into flight management computers. So I decided, okay, well, uh, air traffic control has told us to uh, descend on the D-LAMP 6 arrival, and so 10,000 feet at nerve, and we'll also hit 250 knots. So we do have our top of descent now 80 miles out. We've also, if we got that call from ATC, you know, uh, descend via the uh, D-LAMP 6 arrival, um, Louisville landing north, which is what we would have probably gotten on VATSIM. At this point in the flight, one of the things is as soon as I get that call from ATC, I'm going to come over and put that uh, altitude, the lowest altitude in the star, in the altitude select button. Now, I might not push any buttons yet, but I will put that in there. As we get closer, to our uh, top of descent point, then at that point I'll start getting ready to arm a profile descent. Yes, this airplane will descend by itself um, if you've got everything set up in the flight management computer and you've armed the descent, sort of like a Boeing. The later uh, Airbus A319 2021, you actually have to push a button for a managed descent. This airplane uh, will allow you to uh, let the computer do the automatic descent for you. So the next thing for us to do is to come on over here. We're going to hit the button and we're going to go ahead and update the METAR. Right now the winds are 350 at 4 knots, 10 miles visibility. Uh, it is minus 13 degrees, so a cold snap really has descended in the central and eastern United States right now. I'm still in the middle of one here at SPY HQ, but it's more normal for me in the part of the country that I live. 
uh, so it's a little bit colder than usual. Our altimeter is 3033 and our runways for departure and landing, even though I'm recording the second part of the video a day later, are still the same. We're coming in off of runway uh, 35 left is what we're expecting. The flight plan did put me over here on 35 right. I think the logical reason is we're coming in from the east 35 right. We're coming in as a UPS flight and my guess is that ATC would try and put us out over here uh, where the bulk of the UPS, um, I don't know, they call them gates or stands if you're doing cargo, but uh, the UPS uh, cargo stands are going to be over here. So that's kind of what I'm thinking. That way we could probably hit the Bravo 6 and come on in and grab ourselves a parking place. So all of that is set. Since I'm expecting 3-5 left, let's go ahead and we're going to now plug in the arrival. And so there is the ILS. Here's our frequency. And this airplane is pretty easy to set up, but it's not automatic like the uh, computerized airplanes that we have today. So the ILS frequency is 109.35. Got that right off the chart that you just saw, so 109.35. The inbound course is 350 degrees. And I got both of those little bits of information right here in the little box for the ILS and DME. The next thing I'm going to do is come on down here and right about here. Now every approach is a little bit different, but usually the bottom of the uh, chart and the furthest to the left is what you're going to want to do for your uh, decision height, which in this case is 664 feet. In an older airplane using a radar altimeter just bouncing off the ground as opposed to a barrel reading that we would use with the altimeter, it's going to be 200 feet, which is your standard for an ILS. In this case, it's going to be 664, and we're going to come over here and go takeoff approach and put 664 in that MDA box. And that, that way we're going to get our minimums. I'm going to go back to progress. As far as fuel for the flight, we've had a little bit of a headwind, but my estimated fuel on board is 8.6. Remember over here on the flight plan, we've got um, final reserve and alternate down here. It should be 4.4. Uh, so I have pretty much double the amount of fuel that I need. I generally like to board about 2,000 extra pounds or kilos of fuel as I'm coming in, especially on a VATSIM flight. Uh, for, you know, the in inevitable delays you're going to get. Okay, next thing is you can see the little blue uh, mark here. That's, uh, that's the uh, uh, heading that we have up here in the uh, heading select. Um, nav, LNAV is basically controlling the airplane. But you see I just clicked the top of that and that ended up returning this to, this, to the straight up point here. That's a point that I like to use. I always like to keep my heading uh, updated. And you don't have to do it in an A319-2021, but the Boeing and this old airplane you have to do. And the simple reason is if I have some sort of an autopilot failure, then at least I know that I'm supposed to fly the airplane in this direction here. And that's what kind of helps me go ahead and do that. Okay, other uh, preparations for our descent. Our uh, landing elevation is still in good shape. Everything looks good here. We can go to take off and approach and our VAP speed right now at the current weight is about 133 knots. I always add a knot to that. And the reason that I add a knot to whatever the computer says is I was watching uh, uh, YouTube videos, which is how we learn everything these days, uh, on the uh, MD-11. And the real world pilots that were doing the MD-11 flights when I was trying to learn that airplane would always do whatever speed came out of the computer plus one knot. They always give themselves one more nod on that one. So that's how it is that I've uh, decided to do that. Our top of descent uh, 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 hockey stick is starting to get a little bit closer. So there it is. And now what we're going to go ahead and do is let's try and arm a profile descent. Right now you can see in green it says P altitude. And that has nothing to do with the trip back to the laboratory. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it has, it's called profile altitude. So what we're going to do is come over here to uh, altitude select. And you see my little pointer right here is a normal mouse pointer. Watch what happens when I slide it over the lower part of the dial. See it now how it's a down button? I'm going to click it once. That's like pulling it out. And if you look up here, now all of a sudden PD, PDES or profile descent is now in light blue. That means it is now armed. 
Now as we get closer to about five miles from PDES, profile descent, you're gonna see that starting to flash at you and then it's solid and down you go. So we're all set for a profile descent. Everything is the, the same up here. Uh, our fuel is in good shape. My seatbelt signs are off. The no smoking light is on. All of my lights are on. I uh, did have anti-ice on for my uh, departure. Uh, Philly uh, definitely was a little bit cooler this morning than it was yesterday morning when we did this particular flight. So all of that looks pretty good. Nothing really to worry about here. Nothing's really changed down here. And the airplane is flying along pretty good. Now yesterday on the spy flight, uh, I was flying this airplane uh, as a DHL airplane. And it was over in Germany. And when we landed, you could definitely see that there was ice on the nose cone of the airplane. I did recently turn uh, icing effects on in Microsoft Flight Simulator and it is real. And one of the spy pilots uh, a week or so ago had also turned that on and they ended up getting caught in an icing problem and the airplane literally just fell out of the sky. So uh, you, if you're gonna turn on icing, you gotta take that seriously. And for me, what it is that I do for icing is I will look down here and you can see we have a total air temperature if the total air temperature is plus 10 or lower and you're in clouds, you're in rain, you're in sleet, snow, whatever, any kind of precip, engine anti-ice goes on. And when we landed, uh, and we were doing the landing into uh, Stuttgart uh, yesterday on the spy flight, when we landed looking around the airplane, there was also ice on the leading edge of the rudder and also the leading edge of the elevators. You really could see it on this airplane. So icing was je definitely a thing. So here we go, coming on in, getting ready to uh, deliver packages into um, uh, KSDF Louisville, which is a big hub for, um, for um, uh, UPS. And in fact, uh, early this morning when I was uh, getting ready to do this flight, I did go over and look at FlightAware, the real world flight uh, information, and sure enough, UPS flies an A300 on the uh, Philadelphia to Louisville run. It's also really cold here, so keeping my voice warm. Um, we've got minus temperatures outside here at Spy HQ. Furnace is on, it's but still just warm, warm voice and all. Okay, so everything is looking pretty good here. I think all is set. So at this point in time, uh, now's a great opportunity for me to do all of those things that people on YouTube that uh, uh, say at some point. Usually it's the end, usually a little before the descent. I'm gonna say thank you so much for watching uh, over on YouTube. Primarily most of my flying and uh, content is over on Twitch right now, but I am trying to grow a little bit here on YouTube because uh, I'm doing this as a small business now and trying to keep the lights on, so you do have to uh, go out onto multiple platforms if you're going to do this sort of thing. So that's why I'm trying to come over here to YouTube a little bit more. So all those things that you do to help out somebody on YouTube, I'd sure appreciate. If you really like what you saw, there's some links in the description below uh, uh, for uh, Kofi, which is really easy to use if you really like what you saw, and I'd sure appreciate that. Uh, also, I've recently started a small channel over on Patreon, which is Advanced Flight Briefings. And for the spy flight, when we do our flying around, uh, in the morning I will go and do a complete flight briefing, mostly using Navigraph and weather, and that's over there if you'd like to join us over on Patreon. I do make some of those flight, flight briefings available free and drop the paywall, but the whole idea there is just a little bit extra to help the small business keep going. And of course, over on Twitch. If you've got time to come and join us for the live flights, every flight that we do is a group flight. You're always welcome to hop in your sim and fly along. We do fly an awful lot on BatSim, but we also do some multiplayer flights. So if you're new, it's a great way to come and uh, meet some really cool people. And one of the things that has been really nice in uh, the spy flight over on Twitch is real world pilots are now starting to come in and answer questions if you'd like to know things about real world aviation. Uh, especially if you're young and considering a career as a pilot. Uh, we've got uh, captains that come in from 
major airlines, and uh, sometimes they even hop into an airplane and fly along with us. So it's uh, 757 Spy over on Twitch, and I hope you'll want to come and give a, uh, uh, join us over there. As we get a little closer, I'm moving my map in. You can see we're about 15 miles now from our top of descent. The current time is 1518 Zulu. And one of the neat things is if you're trying to figure out your top of descent, if you look and see TOD, it's going to come up over here in the flight plan. And there's a clock in here and it tells you, you should expect your top of descent at about 1526. So we're a little bit early. Now in this older airplane, we were, I think, talking about the epic upgrade that they're doing with these older Airbuses to bring in, uh, bring in new avionics and better computers and better data into the airplane. Um, I do notice that a lot of the numbers are a little bit squishier in this. They're not exact numbers or the kind of exact numbers that you'd expect in an A319-2021, 20, a Boeing 737. Because again, this is 1970s, 1980s airplanes here. Now once the Epic update rolls out for this airplane in the sim, we should have much better numbers like that too. So always take some of the numbers that uh, we get out of this airplane with a, uh, a pound of salt. And as you can see now, we're coming up on 10 miles or so from top of descent. Profile descent is flashing at us to let us know uh, Captain, we're going to do that descent thing. Maybe you really want to do it because I'm going to descend when we get to the little hockey stick. And you can see now it just disappeared. And you can see over here, over on the prog progress page, we're now on Econ Descent. And down we go. And here we come on into Louisville. At this point in time, we also have vertical deviation. And I've noticed that the vertical deviation on a simple descent uh, or something is usually fairly close to spot on. If you've got multiple uh, constraints coming in, that tends to get a little bit more, the, the word I've been using is squishy. And so it gets a little bit more squishy on these things. And so you kind of have to keep a close eye on it. Um, as you saw, we are getting ready to come into, uh, let's see, we're coming on in and at Nerve, I've just turned constraints on and you turn constraints on up here. So there's the map where 120 miles and constraints are now on. And you can see that that 10,000 feet at Nerve is now uh, in pink there. So the airplane's trying to hit that one. Uh, way back when, uh, when the uh, A300 and A310 came out in X-Plane, a real-world uh, pilot for uh, these old these these airplanes flying flying for a cargo airline came in and said that usually as they um, they'll rely on the profile stuff oh about halfway halfway through but mostly uh, they're gonna go and take over from profile and just do a uh, level change and control their own speed and variable speed descents so that they can hit the constraints and they, they kind of feel like they have to do that manually. So the autopilot still works just fine, but again, the profile is gonna give you squishy numbers and if you're gonna take this into a big VATSIM event and you're gonna be coming in on a star with specific altitudes, you uh, really need to close keep a close eye because it will miss some of those constraints, both altitude and speed. Looking good so far. Let's come on down over here. And 15, uh, that's today's date, 1456 Zulu is when this weather came out. That is 1522, so that is a current weather. So our weather is pretty good there. Next event for us really is gonna be setting the, um, is going to be setting the uh, altimeter. Uh, as a simulated uh, big jet pilot, not a not a, a, a real one for sure. Uh, my general rule is I turn on the seatbelt signs and stuff at around 25 uh, 25,000 feet. This is probably also a great opportunity for me to go and do the. Uh, while I'm not an airline pilot, I do have a private pilot's license, so I do fly smaller. I did fly smaller airplanes. I'm kind of not given that up lately as the hair gets a little grayer and stuff. Uh, but I was able to fly a Cessna 152, 172, and a Cardinal. Um, 
What I'm doing right now is live streaming big, big jets on Twitch and I've been doing that for seven years uh, and flying flight simulators a lot longer than that. So that's kind of what, what, what my background is. Mostly my background was in uh, radio and television broadcasting. Coming on in here, we're coming up on CVG. There is nerve, there's 10,000 feet. As we're coming in, you can see the Cincinnati VOR. And as you look at some of these stars, remember this part from UCATS to Cincinnati and all over to Warsaw, this is not to scale. So you're not gonna see your little pink airplane uh, on the map here, but once we pass Warsaw, you're gonna see the little pink airplane there. As we come in on the approach over here, as we get to D-Lamp, so you can see we've got a pretty sharp 90 degree turn there. We don't have any uh, speed constraints on this, but if I'm gonna be making a turn of 90 degrees here at D-Lamp, one of the things that I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, make sure my speed is 210 or less. Uh, the airplane does have a hard time doing an LNAV turn like this and not overshooting or undershooting. And part of that is, is, you know, I'd rather be less than 210 knots to make this tight turn. But 210 is generally my unwritten rule for how it is that we should be doing that. And all of that is looking relatively good. Here we're coming to CVG. Also, as you look in here, you can see that the map is getting a little bit bunched up here. So now is what I'm gonna go and take it from 120 miles to 60 miles. And as far as our estimated time of arrival, hit that flight plan button, and then you could go down here if you need to get an idea of when you think you might be landing. So there is the approach, there is our runway, and then when it says SDF, 35 left, 1550 Zulu is what we're expecting. We're probably going to take a few uh, 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 shortcuts. In fact, sometimes uh, ATC will give you one. So let's go ahead and do direct to Warsaw. Direct to, and let's do direct to Warsaw, and insert. And so that's not going to shave a lot of time but ATC will do those things for you while you are um, uh, to move you up and back a little bit, uh, especially if you're going into a big VATSIM event, and I'm sure they do it in the real world too, uh, to just to try and get you to uh, move forward, uh, forward and backwards uh, in the long line of airplanes coming in. And a really cool river shot here it's so nice to be able to do morning flights here. Uh, the flight simulator just has really great scenery and morning and uh, evening flights are really nice because you see all sorts of really nice colors and it really can be a pretty, uh, uh, a nice experience. So as we're coming on in here, we're coming into Cleveland. And if you look, oh wow, there's Cleveland Airport. Hi Cleveland. It might look a little bit flat to you. Uh, I don't have a lot of scenery uh, set in and I do use add-on linker. So I only load in the airports that I'm going to be landing and taking off at. So that's why you don't see any of the terminals down there. There's 20,000 feet. I already missed my seatbelt altitude. This airplane, it's either on or off. So we're gonna turn them on. Remember there's five seats behind the uh, behind the uh, ca uh, captain's seat here. So back in the cabin, you can transport. And of course, you know, the big joke we have during, um, during uh, the spy flight when we're flying cargo, especially FedEx, is you gotta always make sure that Tom Hanks isn't sitting back there because, you know, that whole castaway thing. It's probably okay. I don't think Tom Hanks ever flew uh, UPS, so we're probably in good shape. And you can kind of see we are definitely going down here, aren't we? ATC just called, said, hey, direct to nerve. So direct to nerve. And again, uh, you know, doing those sorts of things, that's something that happens. They do that, especially in a VATSIM event, and they'll move you along. 
Coming up on 18,000 feet, our altimeter setting. Again, we check to see if it's current is 3033. So 3033 on the altimeter. 3033, high pressure. There we go, 3033. Now to hit that constraint, you saw it, 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 it's picked up our descent just a little bit. Yeah, picked up the descent so that we can go and hit that 10,000 feet at nerve. But vertical deviation's doing pretty good on this for us. So we'll let the profile continue on, on our descent. We're also descending a good 300, 310 knots. So good speed going down too. Usually on a big VATSIM event, they're gonna start slowing you down about now or speeding you up as it is. So at that point, you would have to, in this airplane, go out of profile to level change and you can control your speed. And you can also use vertical, uh, vertical speed too to try and put your airplane where it needs to be. And the airplane's adjusted pretty good. So vertical deviation has got us not so bad here. Right in the middle, and we should hit 10,000 feet right at nerve. What do we do after nerve? Well, let's go and have a look here. So after nerve, well, let's go and have a look. Something's in the coffee today, isn't it? So right now it says uh, no lower than 6,000 feet, I, I'm guessing, coming in. And what we're going to do is to shave a little bit of time uh, on this. We're going to go from Zoprom direct to Prel. So we're going to cut this little thing here. So eventually we'll do 6,000 feet at Zoprom and then we'll do 4,000 feet at Prel. And if you want, you could even set this into the flight management computer. So we could come over here and let's first of all i only want to have one of these up i don't know if that confuses the airplane but i'm going to go to uh, progress there and now let's go to the flight plan here and at zoprom i'm going to say 6,000 feet and to do that i'm going to go to slash and 6,000 feet and there's zoprom we're going to make that constraint in there and then it's going to have to think about it and so there it is, 6,000 feet at Zoprom. And let's say ATC called and said, uh, uh, expect to pass Zoprom at 6,000 feet. So I'm gonna go ahead and let this airplane go to 6,000 feet. Let's see if it stops us at 10. So a little bit of an experiment here on this. I'm also gonna do another experiment. One of the things that I found is when the plane first came out, I would go and I would preset my auto brakes and my speed brakes. I usually do that a little before putting down the landing gear. And then I put the landing gear down and that turned off the auto brakes, I think. I, it was a while ago. So what we're going to do today is for my normal flow that I usually do, we'll do auto brakes and speed brakes. Okay, there is 11,000 feet. The airplane should show, start slowing us to 250 knots. And you can see it actually is doing that. So 250 knots is in blue and our speed is starting to go down. And let's see if it's gonna try and hold us at 10,000 feet at nerve. Up, oh, it says drag. So it needs a little help getting there. So we've got speed brakes out just a little bit. I, you, you know, we've uh, got them out at about half. And that's probably not only to help us reduce our speed to 250 knots at nerve, but also uh, to continue our descent so we pass 10,000 at nerve. And there's 250, now it stops fla flashing at us. It did put a message more drag in there, so you will have to clear that out. But there's 10,500. We're only descending at 500 feet a minute. I think the airplane's going to try and put us right at 10,000 feet at nerve. So that's pretty good. And if we go over and look here at um, the charts, you can see our little pink triangle there at Warsaw. And we're on our way to nerve right now. So now you can use this as a chart, uh, as a moving map. I generally like to use this as a moving map, particularly on, um, uh, on the ground. So I'll start zooming the new um, 
uh, main base map here in Navigraph. I'll start zooming this thing way in because this makes a great moving map chart for when you're on the ground. Um, and that's, that's really kind of helpful. There's 10,000 feet. And usually around 10,000 feet, I'm going to go ahead and do landing lights. And I'll also turn on the light on the nose wheel for taxi. Most jetliners, when you turn it on, uh, and when the gear's all tucked up, there's a switch in there and that turns the light off while it's down there. I'm going to assume that that's the case here. I don't know. I haven't seen light shining through the floor or anything uh, when I do that, so I'm going to assume that that's what goes on. I could read somewhere in a flight manual if I wanted. And look at that. The airplane's holding us at 10,000 feet at nerve. So it's doing really good. Vertical deviation seems to be off a little bit. I would think that it would be uh, staying steady, but I guess it's going to hold us at 10,000 feet until we pass nerve. So let's see what happens. We are three miles from nerve. And let's see what goes on there. And I'm going to keep my speed up to 250 knots because, like yesterday, I'm also running up against the clock here. So may not be able to taxi all the way in with you. The real world sometimes gets in the way of the Twitch world and the YouTube world in a bad way. And here we are. There's almost half a mile to nerve. And let's see, after we go to Nerve, if it's going to continue our descent. There's the turn at Nerve. And it's starting to hit our descent for 6,000 feet at Zopom. Okay, so we're going to continue there. Now let's go in and at uh, the uh, last checkpoint here at Brill, Brell, we want to be at 4,000 feet. So I'm going to hit the flight plan button again, find Brell. There's Braille. I'm going to put in slash and 4,000 feet. Now, if you're overflying on VATSIM, and my, my, my guess is, is in the real world, it's never as neat and as clean as this. Okay? They're descending you at, uh, at, at, at a rate that's convenient for them. They're putting you at altitudes that they need you at. So you never, I've never had on a VATSIM flight or anything, anything that goes nice and smooth by the numbers like this. The numbers are all over the place. Okay, let's also come on over here and do checklists. And we're doing the approach checklist. Our signs are on. Briefing has been done, sort of. Ecam stat status. Everything in the Ecam looks normal. Uh, total air temperatures in icing range. Landing lights are on. We are start starting to fly through cl clouds. So I'm going to go and turn engine anti-ice on at least. Altimeters are set. Minimums, we've set that. Ignition goes to continuous relight. If we have to go around, we get a little moisture in the engine, we want continuous relight. And landing elevation, we set that over there a long time ago, 500 feet. So all of that looks good, and the approach checklist is done. It does look like we're doing pretty good here. I'm going to go bring the map in now to the 30-mile range. And again, after Zoprom, we're going to go and do a direct two. And if we want to, we could even do a little surgery in the um, surgery in the flight plan. So after uh, Zoprom, we're not going to go to D-LAMP. Let's see if I can delete D-LAMP uh, here. And then we'll delete the constraint. And that's going to take us straight over to D-LAMP. Let's reset the heading bug. And I'm going to continue to try and keep my speed up here. There's 8,000 feet. And it looks like we're going to hit 6,000 feet, probably pretty good. You can see we're descending only about 500 feet per minute. We have about 20 miles to go, so that's good. Checklists are groovy. I'm pretty much done with the econ descent. I'm going to go to take off and approach, and that's going to give me my approach speed of 133 plus 1 is 134, and all of that's looking good. 
definitely a little bit chillier out there. And I haven't looked really well, but if you look over here, I don't know if that's just the normal color or the uh, windshield wiper is showing ice. Now that I've got ice on, I'm starting to look more and more to see if there is ice. And if you look out here, I don't know if that's just shading or there might be some ice showing up on that. We could also come up here and look at the very nose of the airplane. It's not as easy to spot on this one as it is the, uh, the very, very yellow DHL livery. And so we're coming up on 7,000. I think we're gonna hit 6,000 at Zoprom, very nice. And we're gonna go and reset that. And then typical experiences, you know, we should expect uh, ATC to start kicking in and uh, start to vector us around. With this airplane, you are uh, just like the other Airbuses, you know how you turn on the LS system or the ILS system. So we're gonna turn on the captains and the co-pilot's ILS system. We've already set it down here, so we don't have to worry about that. And it looks like we're gonna hit that 6,000 feet at um, Zoprom just fine. So it's doing really good. Pointed straight at the airport. If you look over here, the airport is right there, hidden behind the clouds. And looks like we're three miles away from Haga, then Zoprom, and then 6,000, and it looks like it's going to hit that great. After this, we will do the uh, little turn here, and you can see that one of the checkpoints here at Ollie is above 4,000 feet. We're going down to 4,000 here, so we're all set for a nice tight little uh, turn to final here. The secret here, though, is going to be to pull the speed down a little bit. Right now, we're just cooking along at 250 knots, but as we get a little bit closer in, we're going to really have to jam on the brakes. No sign of the airport. Oh, wait a minute. Is that our airport over there? Nope, that's not the airport. That's just a business complex. Should be somewhere out here, kind of by, there's the river over there. I think maybe that's our airport right in there. It's really easy at night to see these things. And in fact, at night uh, on VATSIM, it's very easy to see uh, some of those really cool, um, it's to, to see other airplanes too. So usually, you know, uh, ATC will call and say, UPS 441, uh, traffic uh, seven miles, uh, 2,000 feet above you, descending no factor. And usually during the day, it's sort of like, I don't see anything, there's clouds out there. But sometimes at night, you can actually see those airplanes on VATSIM because the anti-collision lights are really good. And that's really awesome. After this, our turn is going to be to 171 degrees. So 171 is gonna be our next heading. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that in there right now. And I know that that turn is 171 because I looked over at the chart. And that is right there. So after you make the turn here, you go outbound 171 degrees until you get vectored in for the runway and landing there. And again, I've got my speed here. Ah, we've got glide slope and localizer. How about that? We're gonna start jamming on the brakes here really pretty cool, pretty quickly. Everything's looking good here. Okay, this is our this is experiment time. So as we come in, this is when I'm going I don't need the speed brakes anymore. Speed brakes are armed, auto brakes. We're gonna set auto brakes to medium. And let's see if when I put the gear down, that light goes out. Because as I recall, 
it went out on a landing that I did, and I didn't, as, where's the auto brakes? What's going on? I was able to use tow brakes, but still. So we're four miles from Brel. And then uh, we did not, is it trying to go down to 4,000? It's not. Oh, you know why? I didn't say 4,000 feet. So let's go to level change. I'm gonna go to heading select and we're gonna have to uh, do this ourselves. I forgot, if I'd said that, it would have gone down to 4,000 at Brel. Airplanes only as smart as the sim pilot sitting here. And this looks really great. I mean, if we were on the approach, we would see that interstate highway there and that little lake and the trees. The scenery outside is so awesome. Okay, 210 for the speed. Here comes 210. And that looks good, 210. Is our speed going down? It sure is. How soon can we start rolling out flaps? The V speeds, VFE, velocity flaps extend to right here. So I can do flaps 15 and zero at 250 knots. 240, flaps 15 and zero. There we go. Get as much help slowing this down as we can. Here comes the glide slope showing up here. There's localizer. Next speed is going to be 15 and 15, and that's going to be 215 knots. We are at 220. There's 215. There's 210. We'll wait till it gets right there. And flaps 15 and 15. There we go. Looking good. There's 4,000 feet. We'll go just a little bit beyond Ollie there. And so far, so good. Approach checklist, signs are set, briefing, ECAM set us, status, altimeters, minimums, ignition, landing, elevation. I think we did that. I just did it again because it's always good to make sure, right? Let's get ready for 280 no uh, 180 knots for the turn. There's our speed going down to 180. Let's do a turn of about 90 degrees here. And our next flap speed is 205 knots for flaps 15 and 20. Flaps 15 and 20. There's 4,000. There is a nice 90 degree turn. We'll square it up just a little bit there as we come on in. ATC called, said to set and maintain 3,000 feet. And we're gonna bring in the map another click. And we're gonna go about halfway between the line and there, and then we're gonna get ourselves a nice little intercept course to come on in. How about a little bit more on that heading for a good 90 degree turn. There's our speed at 180, that looks awesome. And it's a good thing we've got anti-ice on, because I'll bet there's moisture in the clouds. What's the temperature on the airplane? Minus 11 degrees. There's got to be ice forming on this airplane now. I don't know again if that's ice on the windshield wiper or not. Getting a little bit closer. We'll call it 300 degrees for our uh, intercept on the uh, ILS, right? That might be good. And almost there, let's go and do 300 on the heading. How about 310 on the heading? 
And now because we have glide slope and localizer, we're making the turn. I'm going to hit the land button now. Here comes that heading bug. How about three, two, zero degrees? Keep the turn going up here as we're turning on in. We're getting closer to the line here. That's a good intercept angle. That looks pretty good. We have got localizer. We've got glide slope. They're both blue. So again, light blue there says that it's armed. So it's set to capture the localizer and then capture the glide slope. Usually on an approach like this, they're gonna say something like maintain 180 knots until five miles DME. We're 15 now, or they'll also give you a waypoint. So maintain 180 knots at Cardinal until Cardinal contact the tower at Cardinal is what they'll do. And here comes the localizer and we are snagging the localizer. And if you look right up there, there is our runway. How about that? Almost like we know what we're doing. Final check of the coffee. Mmm, still hot and tasty. And I usually will go gear at about uh, before te 10 miles or before. That way, if I'm gonna have a problem with my landing gear, I know that there's a problem with that. Here comes the gear. They did really nice on the uh, gear animations on this airplane. All of our landing lights are on, that looks great. Now, how about our experiment? Is the uh, auto brakes are on? So it's still on after doing the landing gear. So landing gear is on, auto brakes are set, anti skid is checked, slats and flaps are going out, spoilers are armed, all is right with the world. Coming up on Cardinal, our landing speed's 132, plus one now is 133. We burned off a little bit of fuel. Now is also an incredibly awesome time to come over here, grab your chart, and we're gonna zoom this all the way in. If we were on VATSIM, I would be looking at V-Pilot right now and looking to see if there is land, uh, ground control. And if there's ground control, when I get kicked over to tower, I'm gonna preset ground control and have that set in because that's such a busy time in the cockpit. And so if I can get ground control preset up, because again, I don't have a co-pilot to set that for me. So I gotta do it myself, and so I can, I'll get that done as soon as possible. There's also a COM2, and I've gotta get good at learning how to use my COM2 radios. There is, coming up on Cardinal, 133 on the speed. There's 133. Flaps are going full. I'm still letting the airplane do the work. There's no shame in using the autopilot up until this point. Again, you're by yourself in this cockpit. There's a lot of work to do. Now the auto throttles are engaged right now. So my physical throttles are where I left them after takeoff. I have the Thrustmaster Airbus Captain's Pack, so I'm gonna move it just slightly below the cruise detent on there. It didn't change the uh, throttle settings on this airplane at all uh, because the auto throttles got us, but I am moving it there for landing. And final checks, gear, auto brakes, anti-skid, slats, flaps, and spoilers. Anti-skid is almost always set over here, normal and on, so that looks good. And then the last thing I'm gonna do is come down here and I'm gonna look at the little wind arrow and it's right down the runway about five knots. Gives me a good idea of what to expect as far as the wind is concerned. And looking pretty good here. And then once I feel I'm ready, I've got all my frequencies set, and life is good at that point. AP is off. To uh, uh, this airplane, you actually hit the AP button a second time, and that's what's gonna silence the alarm. Almost looks like we got a big rail yard over here. Yeah, that looks like a rail yard close to the airport. I'm not surprised to see that, especially since this is a big, uh, a big hub for UPS and cargo. Got 
Uh, blown off to the side, the wind arrow has now shifted a little bit from the left, blowing us to the right. I'm a little bit low. That's okay, we'll catch up. Gently putting my hand over on the throttles. This airplane at 10, your auto throttles will automatically go to idle at 10 feet above. Got a nice city skyline up ahead. What a great day to fly around, even in the sim skies. I think with all the crazy passenger tricks today, if I was young and starting a career as a pilot, I think I'd want to go and fly as a cargo pilot. Okay, my uh, physical throttles are now at idle. And I'm getting ready to go to reverse. Reverse. I think I bounced. And nose wheel down, reversers. I may have bounced on that. 243, ah, oh, that's not fair. 80 knots, stow the reversers. Tap your brakes, manual braking. I'm using Flow Pro for my, um, I'm using Flow Pro for my um, um, uh, landing right there. And outside you can still see we've got speed brakes up. So just tap your speed brakes, they go down. And then off go, up go the flaps. Welcome to UPS land. This is such a huge operation. Now, I've seen a couple of U YouTube videos that show some of the cargo operations. I think it was a UPS. I don't know if it was here or not. And did it say I bounced? No, I didn't. I thought I bounced. So here's the thing about us crazy flight simulator pilots. We all care so much about the landing rate. And yes, landing rate is important, but only to a point. The most important part of a landing is how, where did you touch down? And those two big white bars right there, there's your touchdown point. And as you can see, I did pretty good on my touchdown point. So that's not bad. 243 feet per minute is probably not so awful. So I'm gonna call that a really big success. Now this is a cargo airplane, so one of the things that I'm gonna assume that, that they do is not turn on the APU unless they have to. They're gonna wanna get on ground power. I've also not turned on my lights. I'm blinding my ground crew, but I thought it'd be cool to taxi on in here. So as we come on around, looking good, we're gonna try and put our nose wheel right up on the spot here. This is going to be the loading pad, so I think what we want is we want to have our uh, big cargo door by the loading pad. So let's keep going. Come on, airplane, don't stop. Don't stop. I think that my rudder pedals and my brakes are too sensitive, so one of the things I'm going to do today is try and work on that. And I bet that's where we, where we go right there. So parking brakes are going on. The ground crew is going to come over here and they're going to do chocks. So go to the ground page. We're going to put chocks in place and we're going to go ahead and put a ground power unit in. Look up here when we got ground power in, then we can come down and do engines. So we've got those there. We're going to kind of come on up here. We should have done anti ice. We should have done the landing lights earlier. We should have also turned off the continuous restart done the strobes we're still blinding the ground crew we'll do the cabin signs on that too and turn off the probe heaters and you could also turn off stuff like uh, the um, uh, fuel pumps we'll go and get some stairs important safety tip on this airplane until these two little red things go out if you open your door you will uh, blow the uh, slides and if you blow out the slides, that's bad news. I think the big door would be, I think we would probably be a little bit closer up here. So there we go. And that's it. We had a great flight. And this airplane is, like I said, it's an amazing airplane. Any builds has put uh, such a high level 
of uh, detail in the airplane. It's just an awful lot of fun, and I hope you're enjoying uh, these flights too. I hope you'll come and join us over on the Spy Flight over on Twitch. Uh, it's Twitch TV uh, slash 757 Spy. And as I always like to say, I'm trying to make these videos not necessarily about the right way or the wrong way. It really is all about what works for me. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you back here on YouTube real soon, and I'll see you even sooner over on t Twitch. Until then, as always, stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you in the friendly sim skies.